Okay. Hi. <laughs> hey. Um, so I'm going to invite all of our listeners today or viewers, if you're watching this on, on video, to start to let the eyes wander. We're going to start with some orientation. Um, and Margot and I are going to do it too. So we're just going to let the eyes wander around. If you're driving right now or doing some activity that requires your focus, um, where you can't look around, that's okay. Just start by taking some nice deep breaths with us. And for the rest of us, we're letting our eyes guide us. This is a somatic experiencing exercise to help us come into the present moment. So just notice what happens with your body and your breath as you're letting your eyes guide you. And just notice if your eyes are attracted to something in particular. Just take a moment with whatever it is that they're attracted to. Think in the quality of that thing that your eyes are curious about. And from there, just allow your eyes to close. Again, only if that's safe for you to do right now. Let's take some nice deep breaths. Now that we're here in this moment, just allowing the breath to deepen our connection to ourselves. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel your seat. If you're leaning against something, feel your spine supported. If not, feel your spine supporting yourself. And if you feel like you want to let go of anything or you have some excess energy you need to sort of move, you can exhale through the mouth. And if you feel like you need to cultivate energy and reserve energy, just keep the breath flowing through the nose. It's becoming more and more connected with yourself. And just a couple more breaths. Um, for Margo and I, we're going to slowly open our eyes, but for the rest of you, feel free to keep your eyes closed or do whatever your body is asking you to do as we dive into getting to know Margo. <laughs> so um, let's, before we get into introductions and stuff, let's, let's start with the quote that it, you're working with now or one that's inspired you in the past. Great. So this is um, a poem that I stumbled across. I think someone else shared it and I was just really struck me and so it's by Donna Falls and it's called Walk Slowly. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still, and just like that something in me settles, softens, and makes space for imperfection. The harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper and I remember again that life isn't a relay race that we will all cross the finish line, that waking up to life is what we were born for. As many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times I can make the choice to stop, to breathe and be, and walk slowly into the mystery. Nice. Mm, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, I know what that does for me. What does it, what, so what is that about, what about that poem has been inspiring for you? Um, a couple things. I think just the, the acknowledgement that we all struggle with our inner critic and that we're all perfectly imperfect mm -hmm. and um, that you know, this, this practice of mindfulness, this practice of coming into the moment is there's no end destination. It's all just a practice and we can just keep working on it and working on it. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. You know what? I think I am going to ask you to put headphones on and just see. Yeah. I can hear you pretty clearly, but it's not super clear. So let's sure. see if that, that helps just, a little bit. 
Just give me one second. Okay. Okay, any better? Yeah, that is. It's just a slight, a tiny bit better. And since it's going to be mostly audio people yeah. that are listening to this, um, I don't know. Of course. Okay, great. So um, let's start by just tell me a little, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to interview. It's partially because of your work, but also because of the amazing person that you are and oh, that thanks. you live. So yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. So I wear a couple different hats in my life. Um, I am the mother of two young, beautiful boys who are two and a half and almost five. Um, I am the wife to a wonderful husband, John, and then I have a day job where I work as a social worker in a family medicine clinic um, providing integrated behavioral health. Most people don't really know what that is, but it's meant to be kind of like short-term interventions um, connected to health and well-being, really treating our patients in a holistic way, knowing that um, if someone's struggling with maintaining their health, like diabetes or COPD or something like that, that um, often there are like behavioral and emotional components to that that tend to get in the way. And so I'm kind of there to help people with that um, aspect, all the, the more holistic aspect of that. And then I'm also a yoga instructor specializing in uh, prenatal and postpartum yoga for women. And I teach prenatal yoga once a week here in Portland. And then I also teach a childbirth class called the Yoga Way to, Work, yoga way to Birth. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And um, at your job where you are currently right now with the social work, do you work with men and women? Yep. Yep, I'm seeing men and women and children, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's, it's because we're family medicine, mm -hmm. we see the whole age range, um, yeah, and so it's, it's been nice because it, I do get to work with prenatal clients, which I love, and then um, postpartum clients, and then also I have kind of a mix of other patients coming through my door, too. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, yeah, so... Um, what inspired what has inspired you to in the yoga realm working more with um pre and postnatal women and um the childbirth thing what what brought was it having your own kids that inspired you to go that way or have you always been interested in it you know i've always kind of had like a special interest and um i before i had kids i interned uh, for a year up at ohsu in the center for women's health working with women struggling with perinatal mood disorders and pregnancy loss. And um, yeah, I just, I really loved that work and working with women at that time. It's mm -hmm. a tender and transformative time of life. Um, and so that's definitely where my, my interest has been drawn even before I had kids and then I had my own kids and it kind of blew my mind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I had all sorts of new respect and <laughs> um, was, was deeply humbled by the process myself. So, Yeah, beautiful. And is that, that has that always been, um, that work you did at OHSU, it's OHSU, right? OH yeah, yeah. Um, was that, did, has that been a place that you've always wanted to work with? with women like is that what inspired you to get into the work that you're doing today you know um <laughs> the work i'm doing today i actually kind of happened into the field of behavioral health and primary care um i was looking to be more like a medical social worker or something like that and then um i was offered this position previously working at a nonprofit clinic and i worked there for about three and a half years before i moved over to the county health department mm -hmm. and um it just made a lot of sense to me, you know, the mind-body approach and having um, behavioral health integrated 
into a primary care clinic and just acknowledging that our health is not just our physical body, right? It's yeah. Yeah. so many other aspects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily intend to, to, but it's been a really wonderful um, place for me to land. And um, there's also, you know, like logistics of life, like paying off student loans and things like that, mm-hmm. that played into uh, me staying in this field for, for, for now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonderful. I, I'm, I'm just because you know the nature of this podcast and everything. I, I, I personally know about your work that you did um, with uh, women in pre and postnatal at the, at that clinic at OHSU, and and how that sort of inspired. I knew you did the pre and postnatal yoga. Yeah. Um, and you, and just how you mentioned it's such a you know vulnerable and tender time, whether or not we come full term with our pregnancies. You know, having a baby is, you know, can be traumatic in itself, just on an emotional level, even if baby's born healthy and everything. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, I guess I'm just more, a little bit more curious about that work and how it's um, inspired you in the yoga field. And definitely, I imagine your training in social work has supported all of that. Right. Um, And just, um, yeah, if there's anything more that you could speak to about about that work and how you're sort of integrating that past experience working there and now with your um, yoga classes and the childbirth class. Yeah, yeah. So, well, there's lots that I could say about that. <laughs> um, maybe I, I'm trying to like narrow it down to what would be most most helpful or most useful to, to speak on. Um, Gosh, you know, I I tell this to women all the time, but I have yet to hear a birth story that's identical to someone else's. Um, When I work with women, every birth story is uh, completely different, whether, like you said, it's a full-term birth or um, early or baby's healthy or not healthy, um, mom's healthy, not healthy, you know, like there's so many variables that play into it. And um, it's, it's really... Um, and then also working with women too struggling with infertility and um, trying to become pregnant. And mm-hmm. um, it's, it's this really, like I said, tender and vulnerable time, but it's also so taboo. Mm-hmm. And um, it, I think if anything in my your work with yoga and then also clinically as a social worker is to... Um, have those spaces where people feel like they can talk about those things that maybe they're afraid to talk about the things that um, scare them about the experience um, and the things that um, feel taboo or like they're afraid to really to bring up. And I know, especially in the yoga way to birth class where we really get to dive into mindfulness and yoga as a way for preparing mind and body for for birth, um, we spend quite a bit of time like talking about the fact that birth is um, birth is wild and out of control, and um, our bodies really, you know, we talk about how a woman in a coma can give birth. You know, like your mind does not actually have to be a part of this process. It's a very bodily experience, and um, that there's a lot of fear and um, thoughts and mind processes that come up that kind of get in our way in some ways from, from allowing our body to do the work that it, it needs to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's, it, it is, I mean, the whole fertility, anything around fertility or yeah. hormones in general for women, it is yeah. a taboo subject. I mean, yeah. I myself have endometriosis and, mm-hmm. And now that I'm married and, you know, the, the question's coming, when are you having kids? And I am working on becoming fertile. I, I'm, I may be, I'm getting closer. I yeah. definitely wasn't fertile. And so when I say that to people, they're like, oh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Like, and I'm like, right. well, well, like I'm okay with it because I've, you know, done the work around it. But yeah, because, and because I have a beautiful community around that I can talk about that stuff and I've just made it in my own my own self to be okay um because I'm kind of like you know an advocate for being able to talk openly about controversial you know quote unquote stuff yeah making it uncontroversial and um having a safe space to be able to talk about those things um I think is huge yes Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and so much um 
judgment <laughs> that comes up. Um, and, you know, people, when you bring up something that isn't out of, that is out of the normal, you know, like that um, people have these set ideas and steps that you're supposed to walk through in life, you know, and mm -hmm. when your journey does not match up with that, which the majority of people's does not, you know, in some way, um, yeah. it suddenly becomes this, oh, we can't talk about that or that's not something, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I think that it's super brave of you to yeah. speak about that openly and um, says a lot about you that you've done that work that you can share those things and it helps people then unearth it for themselves. Or, you know, I, I know when I worked, um, prior to going to grad school, I worked in a domestic violence shelter. Mm -hmm. And again, one of those like taboo subjects that no one wants to talk about. But I can't tell you how many times I would say, oh, I'm an advocate for a domestic and sexual violence program. And like 50% of the time, someone had a personal experience with that subject, whether it was their own or a close friend or a family member. And they were like so relieved <laughs> to be like, oh, I can talk about this with you now. We used to joke with my coworkers, like, we just need to tell people we're flight attendants or something, like, <laughs> because we would get so many people disclosing. But it was, it was also so beautiful um, that people felt safe with us to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so how, how, how would you think, you know, I'm, I love having this conversation or just asking people this question who are kind of like, you know, advocates like I am, like, how do you, how would you propose um, to make that more easy to talk about? Like, you know, there's the groups and, and, and things like that. There's resources that you can go to where you can talk about, but I'm more speaking to around like um, peer peers and friends and, you know, what are, what are some steps in your opinion that um, can help all of us be able to be a little bit more um, comfortable with talking about really uncomfortable topics, especially as women, um, I feel like that, that in itself would create a, a stronger sense of sisterhood, like really being able to talk about those things. Um, do you have any ideas or tips about, about that at all or any, you know, just thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, um, like what you said are, is, is kind of the, the, um, formula or method I would uh, mm -hmm. propose to make it more less taboo mm -hmm. um, and more of an open subject, um, whether it's uh, women's health related or uh, domestic violence or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, it's we do the work ourselves, right? Like we find a way to um, process that, however that looks, whether that's with a counselor or whether that's in your yoga practice or running or, you know, or something that, that really helps you to resolve that. Um, and then we share it, you know, and um, I heard, do, have, are you familiar with, uh, what's her name? Glennon Melton Doyle. She's written the monastery and she's like this great advocate and speaker. And um, I like what she says about it, but that we, you know, we share our scars, not our wounds. Mm -hmm. um, and that we, we find a way to resolve it for ourselves and then we share it with others so that it is less isolating. And she's a woman who struggled with addiction and um, really has an anxiety and mental health um, struggles. And she is someone who is a brave advocate and very open and transparent about things in her life. And I was actually super relieved to hear her say that because I worry sometimes about people sharing so much about what's happening in their current situations and um, from a kind of a trauma informed perspective, you know, I want people to feel like um, they share those things in a way that is um, honors their experience and doesn't reopen wounds yeah. in a deeper way. Does that make sense? Totally. I think that's huge. I, you know, I used to, I think myself, you know, I've always been kind of transparent, but I would just kind of like wear everything like on, like, I, like I had a big like screen roll of like, this is what's happened to me. And I was, <laughs> but that wasn't necessarily really, I had to learn how to hold back a little bit so that I yeah. could do my own work. Um, and I think, you know, it can be to like being discerning about who you're sharing it with. Absolutely. When you're sharing it, you know, all, yep. the, all those kinds of things for sure, not to just, you know, blab it out there and hope that you get the response that, <laughs> right. that you, that you're hoping to get from sharing. But, 
Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. That's something um, I ta I've talked about with quite a few women about how it's, it is that I love that. I'll have to get you to send me that woman because mm -hmm. I really like that, that quote. I want to put that up with um, this podcast too, but how it is about how we do our own work and then we're able to really share. And in sharing that, that's where we're inspiring instead of sharing from the wounded place where right. that's just, that's a place where you do need that professional, you know, yeah. support or from really close friends who can really hold you there and not, yeah judge you or get scared or shy away um, because yep. you know like you said every as soon as you said that you are this kind of you know you do this kind of work you had all these people opening up to you and I think it's really true we have so much trauma that we mm -hmm. haven't even admitted to ourselves you know right. we know we know someone who knows someone in the very in the very least you know yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. is there um, is there something a hard experience in your own life or which tends to be the case with a lot of us people who are you know working in these realms and in this field um but not always but is there something in your own life that um you worked through a challenging experience or a trauma that inspired you to get into this this work or um were you just sort of drawn to it just because um, I think a little bit of both, you know, like I think I had some sort of intrinsic motivation to be in this field and always have had um, this like kind of ethical barometer around injustice, you know, that um, when I see something unfair, I just, I feel like I need to say something. I feel like I need to stand up mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I like have this vivid memory when I was in third grade, we did like a I think it was around Martin Luther King Day and they did like that experiment where they give special privileges to the kids with blue eyes and uh, take away privileges from the kids with brown eyes. It's like this supposed to be the sort of social experiment for kids to understand what segregation felt like and, and how unjust it is. And um, I don't think that teachers do that anymore because it probably <laughs> gets out of hand easily. Yeah. Um, but they did that in my classroom and as a blonde blue eyed girl, I like staged a protest at recess and like made signs to like support my brown eyed friends that they should not be treated that way. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think that's always just like been a part of who I am and mm -hmm. part of that. But, um, just on a more personal note, I feel like I have also been that person for family members and for friends um, who they've turned to in times of need and um, sort of got put into a role or I took on that role, who knows, um, yeah. <laughs> of supporting others or helping others and um, being with people in difficult times. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has been a big part of my story and how I ended up in the field of social work for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's really cool. I, I love that story. I can almost have like a visual of you. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Seeing that as a little kid, that's so awesome. That's really great. Wow. That's really, you know, it's, it's not very um, often that we can sort of recognize that, have that recognition in us from so young, you know, have, yeah. I mean, you may have not recognized it when you were that young, like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do when I'm older, but um, it sounds like it is an intrinsic part of you that's just there and it doesn't right. necessarily, um, wasn't necessarily something that you thought about. It was <laughs> happening already. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Yes. Um, I'd like to um, kind of just trace back to um, this, this, uh, the yoga and the, the pre and postnatal, um, obviously, you know, the clinic that you're working at with your social work sounds like an amazing clinic too. And we'll definitely put that up on our website um, for people in the Portland area. But um, also, you know, I think the trauma or the experience of birth and childbirth, I know for myself, I was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around me and I came out blue and, um, and in my own sort of healing process, there's been a lot I've needed to unravel and unwind around around that and it wasn't you know that wasn't even that's not even as half as traumatic as it can be um and and i think it is a it is a a, a topic of conversation among women that doesn't get talked about nearly right. enough um 
that, you know, in, like we, sometimes I host a um, blessing ways and I always try and invite older women who've had babies or, you know, to come in and share their story. And I only started doing that a year ago. And some of the stories, I'm like, how are we not talking about this? Like, I, as a woman who hasn't had kids yet, like, I want to know that <laughs> all these things could happen. Like, yeah. I, and, you know, you read in a, in a book or whatever, but it's not the same as, as hearing, yeah. about, um, hearing about it. So um, I think it's definitely an area that, you know, could be brought about to light a lot more. And it sounds like you do that in your... Um, in your course that you offer you really mm -hmm. allow that space so could you t could you tell us a little bit more about about that course and what you're offering yeah. there and, yeah. what, and actually how you came to develop it and you know sort of where it came from yeah mm -hmm. so um the the weekly prenatal class that i offer is at a yoga studio and it's it really is more about just like movement and breath and bonding with your baby and just um grounding and, and offering that space for women to connect and um, share a little bit about what's happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. But with the Yoga Way to Birth, which is the childbirth preparation, it's a um, six-week series. And then we have a, a seventh class that's at the end um, where we come back after everyone's had their babies and everyone gets to share their birth stories. And it's really lovely. Um, that's the one thing that's missing from my prenatal class right now is people graduate from my class and have their babies and I don't know what's here yeah. <laughs> the other side yeah um so with the with the yoga way to birth um was actually developed a little over 10 years ago by a woman here in Portland named Tina Lilly mm -hmm. and she was also a prenatal yoga instructor and um really found that she wanted to dive a little bit deeper into like what yoga had to offer mm -hmm. to birth and how um we can frame birth um, through the yogic lens um, and it's I think people sign up for the class thinking there's going to be like a lot of physical movement a lot of asana and that's a piece of it but a big part of it is the quieting of the mind and the meditation and we ask um, the couples to commit to like a mindfulness practice for themselves throughout the course um, is a way to sort of prepare mind and body and um, so the, the meditation piece is a huge part of it as well um, and so each class has like a theme um, that we kind of dive into. Uh, the first theme is uh, birth is primal. Mm. Um, talking about how birth is really this like bodily experience and um, just getting to know um, our bodies a little bit better and getting to know um, how our bodies are in uncomfortable or unknown situations. Mm -hmm. Um, second class is birth is wise. Um, and that is really, a, um, diving into some of the just general childbirth education. That's probably more of like the nitty gritty people expect from a childbirth class in terms of like the anatomy and how is baby actually born and what does your uterus really do? And, um, but also just acknowledging that, um, mom and baby play a role in birth and how important that is, um, and the, that they it really is this wise system that was developed. Um, and so getting to know the body in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the third class is about birth is truthful mm -hmm. and truthful in not just um, like it is what it is, but it's also truthful in your own experience, regardless of, of how it comes up. And then um, class four is about how birth is wild and um, really getting to know some of our fears and assumptions and um letting allowing ourselves to um kind of ride on everything we've built on to that point mm -hmm. and then uh the fifth class is birth is dot 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 yeah. <laughs> um knowing that birth just is what it is um it's actually more of a movement based class and um just being with our bodies and then the final class is birth is patient and that's the the last class before we end the series before people have their babies and so it's often that time of waiting and um, preparing and it's a little bit longer class and um, we spend some time just kind of rounding things out and um, like I said it's this really wonderful and the, the classes like really bond together and um, we have people who have 
play groups and nanny shares and (laughs) um, dates afterwards. And they really, it's a, it's a wonderful way of preparing mind and body for this upcoming transformative experience, however it unfolds. And um, yeah, I think uh, Pam England, who's like a famous childbirth educator, she wrote the, she's part of one of the authors for Birthing from Within. Mm -hmm. She talks about how um, any childbirth class that doesn't prepare people for the unexpected is doing the couples a disservice, you know, that are preparing. And that um, that is a big piece of, of what we offer is, you know, like, how do we be with the uncertainty of birth and life itself, you know, and birth is always such a metaphor for so many other experiences in in life as well. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That class sounds really amazing for those of you who are in the Portland area. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, So it, it really, um, Gosh, you seem like you have, it's just great. You have such a, you're such a resource for that. Have you, have you ever, um, had, and I should say that I took the class, John and I, my husband and I took the class when we were pregnant with our first child, oh, nice. which is how I was introduced to the yeah. curriculum and it, and it really deeply resonated with me and, um, prepared me in really unexpected ways mm-hmm. for birth, which I thought was so lovely. And then, um, uh, when I was doing my prenatal yoga teacher training in 2014, when I was pregnant with my second child, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is, I was reintroduced to it. And I was like, oh my God, this would be like kind of the perfect melding of like some of my social work skills and my yoga skills and just kind of pulling it together mm-hmm. to um, do this kind of group facilitation, but also um, sharing the, my love for yoga as well. Yeah. That's great. I love it when it all comes together. I know. So (laughs) nice. (laughs) Um, So how, how um, in those, um, you know, just in the realm that I'm in, because I have endometriosis and the sort of community I've I've um, built around me in supporting myself through that, you know, in that realm, there's, um, there's a lot more potential for things to, to go wrong. And, you know, the sort of the trauma around, you know, trying to get pregnant, miscarriages, um, you know, having to even terminate your pregnancy because it's not in a healthy position in your belly or your own health with them, which is all the things that can happen. And, um, you know, I have a couple of friends who've had stillborns and, you know, just that sort of, you know, I think we, when we think about childbirth or we talk about it, it's so often like, oh, it's so amazing. And it's this miracle, which it totally is, you know? Um, and it really sounds like that program you, you teach offers like for one community to be able to support no matter what's going to happen. Yep. But, and it also sounds like you probably talk about like those things that are, you know, unexpected that we, yep. we don't even necessarily want to even think about possibly right. happening. Yep. Um, and so what, I guess maybe as more of a resource for some of the women that are listening who that has been their primary trauma or their challenge in their life is either trying to get pregnant or, you know, all the myriad of things that can happen that are just so heartbreaking. Um, If you had sort of a piece of advice or a resource or um, just anything to offer, offer them. um, Cause I know that, for the few friends I've known who've had sort of the more traumatic things happen, it's, it it takes them a while to sort of, it took them a really long time to get through it. And some of them still aren't through, through it. And it's been years since since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think support, 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 (laughs) you know, like that can look so many different ways for so many different people. Um, And that, everyone's going to process a little bit differently and in their own time and um, allowing space for what can be a grief process, what can be a reprocessing of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, like you said, in this, in this course that I teach the yoga way to birth, death is probably one of the biggest fears that comes up for people, mm-hmm. um, death for themselves or death for the baby or, um, major birth injuries that result in some sort of disability or just anything that, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just, we don't know. We don't know (laughs) 
<laughs> how that story is going to really unfold. Um, and so I think that, again, it's just like, whether it's going to counseling, which of course I'm a big advocate of because that's <laughs> this is the work that I do and, um, or, or being in a support group, being with people who understand, finding an anonymous online group that you can feel like you can share with openly. Um, there, there are just so many ways um, that, that that can happen. But um, I think the most important thing is to know you're not alone. Mm -hmm. So many people experience that and go through that. And um, it shouldn't have to be that isolating experience and that the isolation that people feel is often a major contributor to the ongoing suffering that can go on with that. And that, um, yeah, yeah. Again, like you said, it can be just so heartbreaking mm -hmm. um, going through all of those processes that you mentioned, whether it's even just trying to get pregnant and the anxiety or losses or terminations or, mm -hmm. And our healthcare system is wholly inadequate <laughs> for supporting women in those yeah. in those situations, and um, being forgiving of your providers because you know they're doing the best they can, and that um, they are not always trained with talking about those things or how to hold a space for those um, experiences, even if they deal with it every single day. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking of a, a friend of mine who um, lost a full term baby and um, she went in for, she got pregnant again and went in for an ultrasound and they couldn't find a heartbeat at her first appointment. And that was exactly how she found out that she had lost her baby the first time and mm -hmm. that there was not the space held for that situation mm -hmm. that um, of course she immediately went into a panic and was re-traumatized by mm -hmm. that experience because I mean, how could you not be right. knowing that that's a possibility now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really, you know, I think that support piece is so big and, you know, it's so easy to isolate ourselves. And yeah. I think, you know, also like speaking to any women out there who have friends who are going through that to don't be afraid to reach out even if you don't know what to say. Just to yes. say, I'm here for you, you know, and it's okay, like, um, you know, that was a process I personally had to go through because I haven't had any babies yet and I, I may not, but all, pretty much all of my friends, <laughs> there's a few that haven't, but I'm at that age where everyone's, you know, having babies or getting pregnant yeah. and, um, you know, to be able to reach out and just, you know, say that I'm here for you for the other people that are having trouble or have had a loss or, or something like yes. that. Um, even though I hadn't, I couldn't relate at all, really at all, other than that I'm a woman and I didn't, I said, I didn't know what to say, but it was really, I got feedback of like, it really means a lot to Absolutely. have someone say that, you know, that, to let them know that they're not alone because it feels so isolating. And there's a, there's a really lovely, um, it's an Instagram page and she also has a website. It's called, I had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's by a psychologist. Are you familiar with it? No. Um, and then she also has a, a line of greeting cards that, mm -hmm. um, express exactly what you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. like, I don't know what to say right now, but I just want you to know I'm here. I'll come clean your house. I'll come, you know, like offering all these things that they could do at that moment. I'll bring you a meal. You can cry. You don't have to say anything. You can say everything, you know, like just offering that open-ended kind of support that, that we can offer, especially as other women, even if that isn't your own personal experience you've been through that, you know, you can be there for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that just creates that sense of sisterhood. Of like, Absolutely. You know, it doesn't matter what our sister is going through we can write to them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, you've given us some really, really great resources. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this again so I can like <laughs> jot them down. And if I don't, you know, if you can remember some of the ones you um, uh, mentioned, please send them along so we can post them on or, or any other resources. We'd love yeah. to just, um, and information obviously about that course. I think that could be really helpful for, for women and um, has there been anyone, I mean, you've mentioned a few people, but has there any, been anyone that's sort of been, or is currently, um, just to close someone who's like really inspired you or, um, been inspiring to you, whether that's a family member or a friend or a colleague or someone that you look up to in the line of work that you're in? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I read that question ahead of time and I had so many people on my list that I don't think that I could even narrow it down to one. Mm -hmm. But I think there's been so many that I have looked to for inspiration, whether they're mm -hmm. professors or teachers from grade school or my mother or my father or, you know, um, all the, the people who have really um, just sort of been there and supported me through so many different things and so many different experiences. And, um, you know, I, I um, feel like resiliency is a big part and bolstering people's resiliency is the part of what I do and helping people. And I think that we all need our like army of cheerleaders around us. And so um, absolutely, uh, whether those people are people you know in person or ones that you've connected through online or read their book or however, you know, like I think that those are all yeah, so there's a lot. There's yeah. a lot. <laughs> well, I think you've mentioned some of them in yeah. here already. And I, yes. you know, I totally agree with you about that. Um, I always say, you know, since I've been doing a lot of healing work with myself around my endometriosis and, you know, wanting to have the, hopefully have the option that I can try and have yeah. a baby. But I did have to assimilate like an army of like healthcare yes. practitioners, whether it's on a psychological level or a physical level. Yes. And I reached out and found community of people who are, you know, a few, I have a few girlfriends who are going through the exact same thing as me. And I, I really did. And, and, you know, I did that because, um, I, I read it somewhere, you know, like you need to, you need to have this support, you know, and I call them my army because they are, I can, at any yeah. point in time, I have at least one person, depending on what I'm going through that I can, you know, connect in with or go have a session with or, you know, have a chat with. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. So it's a, a testament to, to even yourself to that, you know, you've created that for yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. We all need our army of warriors just yeah. like cheering us on. <laughs> to hold us up when we can't hold ourselves up, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for this. I, I feel like I've learned a lot more about you, and I'm, oh. I'm really excited to um, look into all the things that you've offered as resources. And, of course, I'm just excited to see you soon. <laughs> yes. We can make yes. that happen. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for, for sharing all that you did today. Really yes. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. When you asked me to come on, I was like, what in the world am I going to talk about? <laughs> Why does she want to talk to me? I don't know that I have anything to offer or share. So thank you for taking the time. And unsurprisingly, I filled up the whole hour with lots of things to share. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Uh, thanks so much, Margo. Enjoy yeah. your day. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.